what you want, when you want it, where you want it. This is The Mesh. Foot Candle Films. Film news and reviews from two guys who really like movies. This episode is brought to you by the Foot Candle Film Society. For a schedule of upcoming screenings and membership information, visit the Society's website at www.footcandle.org. Hello and welcome to Foot Candle Films. Our special episode is our 2018 Year in Review episode. My name is Alan Jackson. I am the co-director and co-founder of Foot Candle Film Society and Foot Candle Film Festival. And across the table with from me is the Sherlock to my Holmes, hmm. the Will Ferrell to my John C. Riley. Oh if you're dear. if you're okay with that. Oh dear. Yeah, I mean, um, I haven't seen the film yet, but I guess <laughs> I, I wanted to weave them in because it's probably two names that will not be making our list anywhere today. Uh, Mr. Chris Fry, uh, also co-founder, co-director, along with me. How are you doing, Chris? I'm I'm doing good. I'm uh, looking forward to the show. It's, it's always a fun show to do when we kind of reflect back on the previous year in film. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Well, especially since, you know, 2018, I mean, really nothing else happened of interest right. in the so rest of the country. The so movies were pretty much it. Absolutely. So, uh, we can kind of reflect back on the year that was kind of put it to bed right. and hopefully move on to 2019, uh, both with films and maybe in society. <laughs> so we'll see <laughs> who knows. Yeah. It's a new year. It could be a new start or more of the same. We will wait and see. Same kind of goes with movies. You know, we'll have to definitely see, we will be ending the show today with us talking about our films that we are anticipating for 2019, a little bit of a look forward. But before we get there, Chris, here's what we're going to do. Here's the rundown. Okay. okay. Just so everybody can kind of set their chapter markers and know where they want to like what to expect on the table of contents here. First off, you and I are going to discuss our top five films of 2018 each. Sounds good. So collectively, there'll be 10 films mentioned. Now, I predict okay. we will have some overlap. Okay. You and I have not shared these lists, so we are completely going into this uh, fairly uh, fairly blind. My prediction is I think we're going to have three of our five matching. Not the order, but okay. just three of five films will show up on both lists. That's my prediction. Interesting. We'll see if I'm right on that or not. Okay. okay. Secondly, after we both go through our top five films, we will move on to a category that I think is kind of interesting. And I think it's a nice spin on kind of looking back at the year. Uh, what was our most frustrating film experience of the year? Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it was like the worst film or whatever. It's just a frustrating film experience, something that, you know, left us wanting or frustrated or just didn't work in some way, shape or form. But then we're going to flip it and talk about the best surprise of the year. What what element, what film experience really surprised us the most uh, in 2018? Then uh, we may mention a few other ones that didn't make it anywhere else on our list before we move on to that most anticipated 2019. And that'll be our show today. So along the way, I'm sure we'll be expanding on some of the films that we haven't had a chance to talk about this year that we've just had, recently had a chance to catch up with. So it should be a fairly full show. Uh, are you ready to get started? Yes, I am. Okay. Let's do it. We will jump right into our first category, which is our top five films of 2018. So, Chris, uh, let's go ahead and throw a couple of disclaimers out there. Sure. We live in a, a city, a, a region, a part of the state where we don't get to see all the newer independent film releases when they come out. Correct. So there the are, Academy has also not sent us all our screeners. Our yet. screeners have gotten They're lost in the mail, is what, I, what I understand. Right. So there are a few films that we just need to go and put out their caveats I feel like are probably making a lot of top best of the year list that will not be on ours because we haven't seen them yet. Correct. Uh, I'll go ahead and mention the three specifically for me. Okay. Um, the favorite That's... has not played here in this town and we have not had a chance to see it. We have not ventured out of this area to, to, to see it yet. Sure. Uh, and if Bill street could talk, those are two that just have not made it here. Mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and throw free solo, the documentary in there as well. Have not had a chance to catch up with that. My own fault is not seeing Minding the Gap, uh, which I know is available online, so I have no excuse, but that's just the one that's been a glaring oversight for me. Okay. And then I'll throw in there also two foreign films, which absolutely have not made it here, Shoplifters and Burning. 
That covers all my disclaimers. That's your list too? Yep. Good. Well, okay. the exception of mining the gap. You saw mining the gap because you, you made an hour and a half out of your life to do it. And I, <laughs> I did not. <laughs> so, um, did I otherwise, mention I have a time turner like Hermione does in the Harry Potter series? So that's how I found that after I, an hour and a half. I don't watch the Harry Potter movies. So I don't know what that is. So, <laughs> well, with the new ones, the fantastic beasts, maybe you're on the right track. Yeah. The old ones are gold though. Hey, my, you know. One day, one day I'll go back and revisit. So. Fair enough. Okay, so you and I, there are some films that you're not going to hear us mention in our top five. And that's not to say that The Favorite or Beale Street or Free Solo are not good films. It's just we haven't seen them yet. Right. So we don't know. So these are the top five of all the films we have seen otherwise throughout the year in 2018. Um, Chris, would you like to start with your number five? Sure. So, um, I'll also give a quick shout out to, we've mentioned the website before on the podcast, but Letterboxd, um, my top five is brought to you by Letterboxd. It's not, (laughs) but it might as well be because without that website that Alan and I both use to document films and sometimes we write short reviews, you can follow us on there if you like. Um, that kind of helped me formulate my list. You know, it just kind of helped remind me through 2018, you did see these films. Here's some of the ones you ranked higher. So that Without that thing, there's no way I'd be able to do this because yeah. I saw, I think, like 190 or some, two, over 200 movies just in 2018. So wow. it's a lot to keep up with. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. I, I use the same tool for kind of generating my list. It definitely helps to keep things a little more organized. Yeah. So As much as my mind can be organized, True. I guess. So that said, my number five mm-hmm. is uh, Isle of Dogs, uh, the Wes mm-hmm. Anderson film that uh, came out and it was stop motion. Uh, we reviewed it here on the show, set in Japan. The film follows a little boy's, little, I guess, teenager, boy's odyssey as he goes in search of his dog because mm-hmm. all dogs have been banned to an island. Mm-hmm. See? See, the title is really clever. Huh? I, I get it now. Isle of Dogs. I, I was um, lost on the title know, until you right? cleared it up for me there. Um, you can go back if you're really interested and listen to the podcast where we discussed Isle of Dogs and hear what Alan and I both have to say about it. Um, I'm sure we discussed it on that show, but I'm just going to give a shout out here specifically to the sequence where they make sushi. Um, Mm -hmm. I have since seen a behind the scenes that was on the internet where they showed you kind of how much work went into creating just that one little, uh, maybe it was two minute sequence. Yeah, not very long at all. It was short. Um, Just really admire the craftsmanship behind making something that's a stop motion thing like this. And then I like the story. I appreciate the celebrity voices were that were in there they had bill murray who's a regular but then they had brian cranston edward norton bob balaban jeff goldblum just you know lots of awesome people doing the voices for the dogs i really like this movie um i think it will likely be nominated i know it's on the short list for um animated films i think for features for the oscars Mm -hmm. but i wouldn't be surprised if it makes the final five Mm -hmm. um and it made my fifth film so very nice. I will uh, abstain from any conversation on it because <laughs> I may be mentioning a few things about it a little bit later in the episode. Okay. Okay. But Isle of Dogs, Wes Anderson is Chris Fry's number five film of 2018. Yes. Um, What's your number five, Mr. Jackson? Um, you mean my number fives? Oh, dear. No, I, I did. I did have a tie. Okay. But I, I promise you, thematically, it works. Okay. So just you got to kind of ride with me on this. Okay. Um, I had a hard time picking between two films that left me, um, very happy, warm hearted, Mm. uh, nostalgic. Okay. And honestly, these two films both kind of did the same thing for me. Interestingly enough with one of these two, it was the second time I saw the film as opposed to the first time. Hmm. So, uh, first off I'll say, uh, won't you be my neighbor? The documentary about Mr. Fred Rogers. Okay. Again, I saw this film twice. Well, Almost twice. The first time we, I saw it, we, we reviewed, reviewed it on the show, and I was lukewarm on it. I really was. I, I I felt like it was fine, but I thought, other than the nostalgia it played up, there wasn't a lot deeper to it. Come to find out, I realized during that first viewing that I was really really tired, <laughs> and I think I missed a good chunk of the film in the middle of the film that uh, uh probably should have seen. <laughs> So probably watching the film a second time, it all kind of gelled a lot better. It it worked a lot better for me and, uh, had a really good time with it. And it's just, I I think it's, it's, it's a simple documentary. It doesn't do anything from a, from a filmmaking style that's challenging or different than other documentaries, but 
the wealth of archival footage, the wealth of interviews we had, um, the people so close to Fred Rogers' life commenting sure. on it really made it a, a standout piece for me. But I'm tying it with the film that I guess I'm going to say is really my true top number five. Okay. Um, Mary Poppins Returns. I caught up with Mary Poppins Returns on uh, Christmas. Okay. And really, really appreciated what they did with that film. I, uh, I'm i not a, a, a huge fan of the original. I mean, I liked it. It was great. But this one, I felt like uh, I think they set out with a goal of, of making, kind of bringing back that classic style of the Disney film, the musical. The with family film. The family film. And it Disney absolutely film. was. And I think sure. it just worked. I was smiling almost the entire film. And I guess I should say PG Disney film. So it's not yeah. like a Marvel film that's kind of come out. It's absolutely. a PG straight up family yeah. film. Uh, I will say I thought um, Emily, uh, Emily Blunt did a, a, a serviceable fine job. Okay. She was not necessarily my favorite part of the film. I think, you know, there were other other standout elements to the film, but she was perfectly fine and did great in the role. Okay. I've also uh, seen it, so we mm-hmm. won't go into a full review, but okay. I'm just interested to yeah. hear since we obviously it came out around Christmas. We haven't had a chance to review it. Haven't caught up Alan, since you then. said she wasn't your favorite part of the film, although she was serviceable. She was good. So she what, was good. Was your, what was your favorite? Well, part it, it wasn't any one performance. I think just, again, I've got to give it to the tone and style of the film. Okay. They were not afraid to go back to that 1960s, 1950s, 60s, throwback style of storytelling and just letting the imagination run wild. So the film progresses. We have a very recognizable story for anybody who saw the original Mary Poppins. And I will say the first little bit, I'm like, okay, so this is just going to be kind of a retread of like the original film. And they got into the first um, song sequence, which was kind of this underwater with a lot of, and you know, CGI and different animation stuff. Right. And that was fine. As the film went along, though, I think they started to take a few more interesting challenges. Uh, there's a sequence that takes place basically in a in a bowl, um, a ceramic bowl, which I thought was really interesting. That was my favorite part of the movie. Yeah, yeah. really creative, just something a little different. Um, so the book, not its cover, I think, is a song they do. They do while they're inside the bowl. That was my favorite song. Yeah. In the movie. Um, the critics are saying, you know, the music's not as, as spectacular as the original. I think it's just a matter of time. I actually think some of these songs, if people hear them enough and you go to see, you see the film a couple more times and they kind of work their way into our culture, I actually think they're, some of them are just as memorable as some of the original ones. Well, I think, um, you know, I liked the film okay. Mm-hmm. Um, that was kind of, a, I guess it's an easy criticism to lob against the movie upon walking out of the theater is, oh, well, the music's not as good as the first one. And I, I agree with what you're saying. Immediately, that's kind of where I fell. I was like, I liked it, but the songs are no Chim Chim Cherry. The songs mm. are like, no, no, Let's Go Fly a Kite, Spoonful of Sugar. I can continue rallying. But you're right. I've seen that movie a hundred million times. Well, I grew yeah. up listening to the songs. Mm-hmm. I unfortunately spent a long time working in a Disney store when I was in high school. <laughs> that's so, true. So, so you've, you've heard, you've these heard songs. them probably more than the average. Right. Ad nauseum. So you take a step back, and I think you're right. Over time, I think they probably, will they all resonate as much? Maybe not, but they will resonate more. And I think Mm -hmm. it's an unfair criticism to just say, oh, well, the songs are, I think there are a lot of good songs. And I think over time, I agree with what you're saying. I think they'll, they'll grow in stature over time. And I believe Um, one of the ones that's on the, uh, there again, the Oscar short lists were just recently released. So I may refer to them a couple of times. Um, I cannot remember the exact name of the song, but it's like no longer here or not. There's some song they sing about, Um, the mother not being present, yeah, but she's well, never really gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that kind of is the placeholder for Tuppence a Bag, which was yes. in the first movie. There again, I can recall the names because <laughs> you know, I've yes. heard them a hundred million times. Um, but that song was also really strong and was kind of one of the emotional core songs of the film. And that one was really strong as well as the other one that something about a book and a cover. I can't remember the phrasing, but I really liked that one. As well. um, the place where lost things go. Thank you. Is the song that you're talking about. Yes. I absolutely love my, my favorite sequence of the film was the triple light, little light, fantastic okay. late in the film, which is, all of the um, lamplighters yes. having a big choreographed dance number at night with some great, you know, just lit by candles everywhere and uh, even using bicycles and all. It was just, it was really energetic and I just felt really swept up by it all. Okay. So I love the energy of the film. I love the fact that they weren't afraid to go and be a throwback film. 
Um, I thought Lynn Manuel Miranda was very good. I mean, I'm um, on the first name basis. I just call him Lynn. Just Lynn. Yeah, <laughs> LM. Um, he yeah, was very good as was, Jack, the, awesome. uh, the lamplighter. You know, I'm glad, I, I don't want to get into spoilers, but I'm glad they don't push too hard on any relationships. That's an interesting choice. Yeah. And I think they very easily could have. Yep. But they don't. And actually, I th- this film in many ways does kind of break the mold of the original Mary Poppins. It does mm-hmm. have some different things. But I think one of the interesting notes that they return to and land on is the end of the film is the family unit. Yeah. And the end of the film with the first one with the let's go fly a kite sequence, very much the family m- m- unit. So, yeah, I, I, they were very true to the original, but still like took some chances mm-hmm. and things. And I think, yeah, it really works. And I, I do admire the fact that with his character, they could have made some more um, sell out updated choices, but they didn't. Yeah, they didn't. They, they avoided that. And I thought uh, I thought it just worked. I thought Ben Wishaw as, as Michael Banks is really good. Ellie, Ellie, Emily Mortimer as, as uh, Jane. All good, good performances, good actors. I mean, I, I, I kind of was along for the ride the whole film. They worked in cameos, which you know sometimes you can kind of groan at some of the cameos people bring up in these these retread films. I thought all the cameos worked, and there's one cameo towards the very end. If you've seen the preview, you probably have already been spoiled on it, but I'm still not going to say it. Someone from the original film has a, a sequence. And I thought it was really great. Um, I didn't know if she was in the original. Oh no, I was film? talking about the hymn. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, kind okay. of in the more climactic well, scene. we're really having to dance around. Here we are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Dancing, yeah, yeah that is just like that. Uh, yeah. Dance. So um, I thought his role, his cameo was great. Oh, I did too. And it was, I mean, yes, it was fan servicing, yes yeah. and all, but it worked. It just was so nice to see. Agreed. And then, yes, there was a female cameo at the very tail end of the film that also was very small part, but it just worked as well. Oh, so I, I'm, was, I was happy with all that. That was awesome. Uh, I will say... Um, it's not going to make my top five. Well, um, I, I, I'm assuming not. <laughs> um, it's not going to make my top five, but I will um, say that one of the things that did not work for me, okay. um, because it, it felt like it was kind of a cameo of sorts. Oh, yeah. Um, and there you're going. Meryl Streep's. Yes. And it, it's not just her. It was just her part, her song, just for something about it. Almost in a way it was, there again, I think... Is this based on a book? I know Mary Poppins is based on a series. I don't know if this particular story is based on I'm not sure. a sequel to the original. I, I don't know. I don't know if it's adapted from anything or just written originally for this. Because um, the original Mary Poppins movie, you know, they have the uncle who loves to laugh. And in yeah. this one, it was an uh, it was the aunt of Mary Poppins who has upside down things and fixes stuff. Yeah. It just, and I didn't, like, something about it just. It was the work. one part of the film that I felt like very possibly could have been something they went and redid later mm. and tried to shoehorn into the film that just gotcha. didn't work. Now, I like the concept of this upside down, everything kind of you top, turning on its head yes. and looking. The song was probably one of the least memorable songs in the film. Yes. And I do feel like Meryl Streep kind of being put in as a cameo when she had nothing to do with the previous film. It just seemed a little forced. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, she is. A, she does have a good voice, so I could see oh, how sure. like, you know they use her. No, for and that. she's a great actress, but yeah, it's uh, something. It didn't it. need to be there, I guess, yeah. is the thing. So, uh, Mary Poppins Returns. I really had a good time with it. Uh, um, I will never forget the the look on my twelve year old uh, son's face, who had never seen the original Mary Poppins. Interesting. As we went to go see this, and the very first moment. All the kids went into the bathtub and go into the giant animated underworld sequence. <laughs> he looks at me and is like, what are we watching? Because <laughs> um, I don't think he had any clue what, what was going to be going on. Fair enough. Um, but he ended up really liking the film. So, I mean, if the boys come out of it enjoying it at that age, uh, I think that's a winner in my book. I had a really good time with it. So, that's my number five. But a pseudo tied with, with Won't You Be My Neighbor. Because I do see both of them in kind of that... Give me some sentimentality. Give me some nostalgia. Make me feel really good. Give me a good, warm-hearted film right here at the end of the year. It, those two kind of worked on the same plane for me. You've needed a warm-hearted film in 2018? <laughs> yeah, for, for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. All right, so that's my number fives. So, Chris, what about your number four film? So, my number four is also a film that we reviewed here on the show, it is uh, Charlize Theron in Tully. Oh, okay. And um, with this film, it's billed as a comedy drama. And then actually I see on IMDb also listed as comedy drama, comma, mystery? 
mystery. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think because of some of the yeah. things that we kind of danced around when we reviewed it, there again, if you're interested in our review, you can go back and look at an earlier episode. It's basically Charlize Theron plays a mother of three who hires a night nanny to help her with her newborn because she she's struggling. Uh, she mm-hmm. She's married, her husband works a lot, sometimes goes out of town. And she is just she's run down. Yeah. Um, there are some funny moments in the movie, so I wouldn't. Re- but I wouldn't really deem it a comedy, comedy is a stretch, right? Yes. And mystery, I'm not going to really say that mm. either. Um, but it is a worthwhile drama that I strongly recommend. That's why it's at my number four. I would like to think that maybe Charlize Theron would get noticed come Oscar time, but who knows? Um, she's definitely worthy of it. I thought she was really good in this role. She would be a long shot. I'd love to see it. Yeah. Because uh, I do think her performance was really strong in that. Uh, Tully's an honorable mention for me. Okay. Uh, did not make my top five, but was one I certainly considered uh, because I did also thoroughly enjoy the film. Thought it really worked. Uh, I thought of a little bit of uh, the director, hopefully kind of a little bit of a return to form. You know, yeah, I didn't just, even uh, mention Jason Reitman. Jason Reitman. You know, I was a big fan of Up in the Air and then Juno before that. Sure. He's had a couple of films that haven't worked, especially I know a couple you've seen that did not work at all. Correct. Labor um, Day. Yeah, Labor Day especially. So I'm hopeful that this is maybe one that's come back now. Since then, he's done the film uh, The Candidate. He did the film with uh, about Gary Johnson, right? Uh, which did not do too well and didn't get the with best Hugh reviews Jackman either. And, yeah. yeah. So I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully he can stay on track. But totally Gary, was Gary Hart. Oh, Gary Hart. Sorry, not Gary Johnson. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Got my Gary politicians all mixed up there. <laughs> uh, Gary Hart, yes. Sure. Uh, so hopefully Mr. Reitman can keep up with what he did in Tully, because I do think that was a really strong film. Sure. Okay, so that was your number four, Tully, by yes. Jason Reitman with Charlize Theron. Uh, my number four, I promise it's the only other tie I've got. My okay. top three are not ties. All right, all right. But again, these two work together, and I'm, I just could not choose between them. And they just thematically are very similar to each other. Uh, one of them you've reviewed and talked about, I had not seen. The other one we both talked about. So the one we both talked about before we reviewed was Black Klansman, so okay. Spike Lee. Uh, the more I think about this film, this is probably one of the films that has stuck with me the most. Certain images, certain sequences have kind of kept coming back to me a lot more with this film. We both reviewed it earlier in the in the year. We both liked it. Right. Um, I think it's one of Spike Lee's strongest work in years. Um, really, really enjoyed the performances. I thought the mix of humor with some very social relevance uh, themes worked. Um, John David Washington as the lead actor, I thought was great. There's been some kicking around. I think he got nominated for a Golden Globe for I acting, I believe. Think so, um, playing Ron Stallworth. Which by the um, time you hear this. You will know if he did or not because the Golden Globes are actually going to take place the, the weekend. <laughs> it's Friday. We're recording this podcast. I think they take place. Or oh, are they this week? Uh, this coming weekend this coming for weekend. us? Yeah. Okay. So, so you'll know. Did <laughs> uh, did John David Washington win for best? You tell us, listeners. I don't know. I, I don't know at this point. But sure. Um, Adam Driver as Flip Zimmerman, his his partner, the stand-in uh, at the uh, Ku Klux Klan rallies. Topher so, Grace. Topher Grace, yes, as David uh, as David Duke. Some great performances. Um, overall, uh, you know, it's an important film because even though you can watch it and you can be entertained, there's action scene, there's a bomb situation that's kind of very tense and mm-hmm. has a lot of drama built up. There's some comedy, especially with the, the way that Ron Stallworth is kind of working his way into the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, but... Man, there's some really heavy messages, too. And I think the ending of the film is probably one of my favorite endings in a while. Okay. Where it ended on some, it ended on a sequence. The the ending of um, the actual. The whole thing. Okay. So there's a last scene with Ron Stallworth and um, uh, the the girl, and I forget her name. Tessa Uh, Thompson's the actress. I don't remember the. No, it's not Tessa Thompson. It's, uh, I know you're talking about, it's not, it's Laura Harrier. Okay. Uh, playing Patrice Dumas. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's Patrice and, and Ron Stallworth. They have a scene together that leads to a kind of really a, a great tracking shot. And then it does cut to some real um, real archival footage, gotcha. uh, real news footage. Gotcha. The whole sequence is both kind of jarring. It's 
troublesome and you know it kind of leaves you at a different space at the end of the film where you could have just tidied it up and said oh yeah everything's great uh mission accomplished and we did this and we made some change but then you realize no we really didn't make that big a change yet that to me was a really impressive feat in a film so my mind is jumbled tessa thompson is not even in this film (laughs) but I will tell you, so Miss Tessa Thompson is in the other number four I've got, which I did get to catch up with recently. Sorry to bother you. Sorry to bother you. You have reviewed on the show, I think, as a quick review. Did you not? I gave it as a recommendation. Oh, you gave it as a recommendation. And which meant I probably talked a little bit about it. Okay. I didn't actually review it. So I finally had a chance to catch up with this film. I was way late to the game seeing this film. I freaking love this film. I thought it was inventive. I thought it was hilarious. I thought it had a lot of important things to say, but it did in a very fun way. But most importantly, I love the fact that the last 30 minutes of this film went completely (laughs) off the rails. Absolutely. And loved it. Every bit of it. The look on my face when there's a certain scene that kind of introduces this whole new twist to the film uh, is was amazing because I just had no clue where all this was going. And we're not going to spoil it. No, we're um, not. But I will spoil my number three because it is sorry to bother you. Okay. All right. Great. Um, I love this film. You know, I talked, like you said, I mentioned it as a recommendation on our podcast, um, but didn't really go into a full review, which I think it's okay. Um, I think it's actually good to go into this film, not really knowing a whole lot. I agree. What it's about. Um, basically, you know, it's, uh, Lakeith Stanfield, who was in Get Out, um, had a really mm-hmm. small part in that, but he plays Cassius Green, and he's trying to move up the corporate ladder in like a call center. <laughs> and that's pretty much all you need to know. That's really um, it. Yeah. And the, the whole going off the rails, I can understand why it totally doesn't work for people. Mm-hmm. I get that. It just... You know, if you've been listening to this podcast before today, you kind of know, kind of getting a feel for my sensibilities. Oh, it was totally fine with me. (laughs) And, you know, I I kind of go off in left field and like crazy movies every once in a while. And yeah, that swerve worked for me. I can understand, totally understand why it doesn't for other people. But for me, it was strong. It cemented it as my number three film. Well, it was just incredibly creative a film, too. Um, I'll say this early on. This is not a spoiler. I think it's even in the trailer. You're right. The story does kind of start off and it builds from this telemarketing. So the first half of the film is pretty heavy into this whole telemarketing field and the fact that you know our, our, our lead character, played by Lakeith Stanfield, Cassius Green, uh, is trying to get a job. He gets a job as this telemarketer. And early on, he's basically told to be successful, you've got to basically have the white person's voice and you've right. got to kind of change who you are. You've got to put on this different front. And that really propels a lot of the story for quite a while. Sure. Um, there's a really creative scene, though, when he starts making those phone calls where basically his desk would drop into the house that of the person he's calling. Yes. So he's actually seeing them like kind of in front of him as he's trying to sell them encyclopedias. Was that what they were selling, I, <laughs> I believe? So, so yeah. yeah. Um, that was really creative, also extremely funny. There's some sequences uh, having to do with his his girlfriend, who's an artist. I think Who it's kind of played interesting. By, like you mentioned, played Tessa by Thompson. Tessa Thompson. <laughs> so maybe that's where you're getting yes. those confused. Right. I loved his best friend played by Jermaine Fowler, Salvador. They have a, they have an interchange when they've starting to come to heads with each other or a little bit more antagonistic, antagonistic with one another, an exchange that I was busting out laughing. How funny it was. It was played off on screen by these two. Yeah. Um, overall, just, I thought it was great. And like you said, when it got to the turn, got to the little bit of a interesting twist in the film, I was already so on board with the film. I, happily zigged in that direction. And uh, I will just say this. And again, no spoilers, but if you recall the very last scene of the film, it actually breaks up the credits a little bit, right? When the credits start, Um, my wife walks into the room, having not seen any of the rest of this film and only saw that last shot. Wow. And she's like, okay, uh, so she already had in her head what type of film this was. I'm like, oh, no, no. You have no idea. You have no idea. So what yeah. um, that's going to be one we have to go back and revisit at some point. Awesome. You know, first time feature film director, Boots Riley, um, who's a musician himself and has done music videos and Soundtrack other things. Soundtrack this film is great. Oh, it is. It's so good. And uh, I'm terribly excited to see what he does next. And I, I hope it's know. anywhere close as creative as this film. And apparently this one took a while because he is a new musician. He has a band. Um, cannot remember the name of it offhand. Mm-hmm. Um, but 
it took a while to make this film. Like, I think it was, you know, they just worked on it, rewrote it. So it had been like two, three, maybe even more than that years in development. So I don't know how long we'll have to wait for yeah. Mr. Uh, Boots Riley to do another film, but it'll be worth it because hopefully it'll be as good as that. I think it'll be worth it, you know, because he just seems to have creativity all over the place. Yeah, so, I, I, I'm, I'm excited. But yeah, that was probably one of my greatest surprises watching this film just in the last couple of weeks over the holidays and uh, really enjoying it as much as I did. So as my tied for number four with black Klansmen again, both I think very important films, they both deal with social equality and, and, and how we deal with different perceptions of race with one another, obviously one doing it in a very historical form and a little bit more, uh, you know, kind of, uh, some of the real hate field side of things. The other one having to do with stature and where society places people based on sometimes skin color and just how, how damaging that can be. Both of them dealing with some humor, both of yeah. them having some sure. elements of humor, which I think makes them work as films. Right. But at the end of the day, there's still some really important messages to, to share. So agreed. Well, I've done my number three, so I guess we're good. well, and I've done my number three. Oh. So your number three was sorry to bother you. My number three was Isle of Dogs. So wow. we've already talked about Isle of Dogs, but I'll mention just a couple more okay. things about it. Isle of Dogs was my number three film of the year. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed this film as well. Um, I will say with this one, um, taking apart the Wes Anderson side of it, which you know we're both fans of Wes Anderson as a filmmaker. We, we both are. like his cinema, his, his, uh, his style and uh, the, the way he puts his films together. This one, I think the, the blend of the stop motion animation and the creativity that was put into these worlds he created – um, is what really got me for this. I, I could probably watch this film with no sound oh, and be wow. perfectly happy Hadn't thought about because it. it's yeah. just so interesting to watch. Um, actually that may even be a good exercise because I think there's so much stuff going on going sometimes on in, the in the frame, frame. Sure. that you can sometimes get distracted, and not pay attention. Uh, the voice acting was great. Uh, I love all the performances of all the main dogs in the film. <laughs> um, and you know, I like kind of the social message it had to share as well with things too. So sure. Isle of Dogs, uh, I've seen it twice this year. Uh, really, really enjoyed it. Um, it's one that I was looking forward to seeing the second time, which doesn't happen too often with a film. Sure. But I was ex terribly excited to see it the second time. I'm glad I did. So that is my number three film, uh, Isle of Dogs. I gave my daughter that DVD for Christmas specifically so I could watch it again. <laughs> oh, did you really? So, Good. I Good. mean, she actually also liked the film a great deal and actually had it on her list. Yeah. But that was one thing I made sure she got so that we could actually watch it again. So. Very good. So, so far, just so I'm keeping track, Chris. Yes. We have two of our films. Correct. Uh, the same. Sorry to bother you and Isla Dawson. My Dawson. prediction was three. Correct. We'll see if that holds up. And I think it will. So, okay. uh, you want to go on to your uh, number two film then? Yep. And this is your chance because it won't happen with the number one. I guarantee you don't know what my number one is. Okay. I don't think so. Um, so my number two is a film we just recently reviewed on the podcast and we gave our kind of recap of the festival that we had back in September. Mm -hmm. It's American Animals. And uh, Alan is nodding his head. So I'm thinking mm -hmm. this, must be the th this must be the third <laughs> of the similar ones in our list. Mm -hmm. I really liked how they mixed – Lots of different genres. I mean, it was basically, it was based on a true story. And uh, so kind of that type of film, but also has the actual people that were in the true story about some guys who tried to pull off an art heist. Uh, it actually has the real people in the film at some points kind of directly talking to the screen, almost like a documentary. Um, but it has some elements of comedy in there, a heist film, just has a lot of really interesting pieces and parts that make up a spectacular whole. And until very recently, it was at my number one spot. Um, but it is now my number two American animals. I, uh, highly recommend it. Alan, hmm. what is your number two? No, I'm just, I'm hold on. I'm just trying to process what would be Chris's number one now. Oh, don't spoil it. No, no, I won't. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. I'm just really honestly curious. Okay. Um, okay. We'll get to that in a second. Um, yeah. So, okay. Well, let's just go ahead and do this. Okay. So American animals is my number one. Okay. Uh, so I'm skipping over my number two just for a minute. Okay. Just to say American sure. animals, my number one, because that what I'm going to do is then I'll mention my number two gotcha. and then you'll do your number one and we'll, be, we'll be done work. So I'll say American animals for all the reasons you, you mentioned and all the reasons we mentioned in our uh, review not too long ago after the film festival. Um, I still think this is one of the most exciting films I saw this year. 
to me it was creative. Uh, it was an interesting story. I liked all the characters involved. Uh, I know there's been some criticism about the film about whether or not it's glorifying people who do a criminal act. I never got that from this. I, I felt like I'm not at all downplaying what they did. Sure. But in the grand scheme of all the crimes that we could see a film about, it's really on the lower end of those criminal activities. But I also feel like the film does a really good job of showing us the impact that I the crime agree. has on the main characters, too. I would agree. So I, I didn't buy that criticism at all. I don't think it glorifies it. I actually think it's probably one of the best anti-crime films to show some younger person that what you see in the movies or what you think in your head could could happen if you do this doesn't happen that way. And that's not real life. This film is a much better showing of what real life is going to look like. And the mixing of the real life documentary type style interviews with the dramatic versions and the way they mixed those, that was a creative way too. It wasn't just cut to an interview and then show the scene of what they're talking about. They really interacted with one another in a creative way. Right. Uh, I think all too often kind of touching on the criticism you mentioned all too often, if you just had a straight up, you know, drama or crime drama where you just showed the events you may come away with the feeling of, oh, maybe it did glamorize it a little bit. But I think it was inserting those documentary elements that kind of showed you, no, this is A, real, and B, you can tell it really affected the people that did this and kind of doesn't let you have too much, quote-unquote, fun in the movie by the anticipation or the excitement of could they pull this thing off because it it slams you into reality pretty well, like letting you know that, no, this is real and it affected real people. Yeah. No, I, I think did a great job with that. So I um, was very, very happy with that. And again, I've seen it three times now. Loved it all three times. So a lot of when I'm putting together my top five is like, which films did I see multiple times? And I was wanting to see multiple times. Gotcha. And I was just as excited to see it the second, third time as I was the first. And this is definitely one of those that fell in that category. So it is my number one film okay. of the year. Stayed that way from really April of this year when we first saw it through the end of the year. So uh, I'm still my favorite. Going to really look forward to seeing it a fourth time soon. So let me go ahead and mention my number two, and then I'm going to toss over to you for your number one. And okay. uh, I think I have a guess as to what your number two. Yeah. Maybe the second yeah, I'm, musical. In your I'm program? sure you do. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to say my number two film is a star is born. Yes. It is probably the one that's going to win best picture. Uh, is my guess on the Oscars. And honestly, I think I'd be okay with that. I think it's warranted. I know American Animals isn't going to win. So (laughs) I might as well go for my number two film of the year. Um, A Star is Born. This is obviously, in case you've been living under a rock for a while, this is the (laughs) film with Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper, directed by Bradley Cooper. It is the fourth version of this story on film. I think that's right. Yeah, I think so as well. And you know, this had everything going into it that I was not interested in. Okay. Um, it's the fourth telling of a story that, you know, I never really thought much about any of the previous versions. I'm pretty sure I saw the 1970s Barbara Streisand version as a kid and didn't really resonate with me. Okay. Um, not a big Lady Gaga fan. I mean, I admire her as a musician. I think the performance style is really interesting, but I just don't like any of her music personally. Sure. Uh, so, you know, all that stuff, I just, uh, Bradley Cooper is a first time director. Uh, thought it could be more of a vanity project, so I didn't get really interested in it. So it almost would have worked out as one of my biggest surprises because I really didn't go in expecting much. Gotcha. But what I got was not only a film that I thought was expertly directed for a first time director, um, had some moments that were just the camera was very loose and very some great moments with the songs and with the energy from those performances. Um, A lot of close ups, a lot of great use of faces and just and I thought the acting was very effortless from uh, both Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga. I thought we're both really strong. Uh, I'll probably give the edge to Bradley Cooper because he probably surprised me the most. Okay. He's an actor that really, I think, upped his game with this film quite a bit. The film still got me from an emotional standpoint. still got me from an uh, uh, energized standpoint during the songs. I will admit the song loses some steam or the movie loses some steam in the second half. I think the first half is much, much stronger than the second half. Um, and the film might have slipped down the list for me if it, by the time you get to the closing number, cause the closing number also does not work the way it's staged and filmed, but there's a moment we talked about in our review where it cuts to, 
a shot of different people singing the song that, that Lady Gaga singing in the closing that brought it right back up in my estimation and said, okay, yeah, this is, this is a really good film. So it's my number two. I will say earlier in the list as I was batting these around, it was batting around between two and four, somewhere in that range in my list, but it's always been in my top five. Um, saw it twice. Was super excited to take my wife to see it the second time. Just had a really good time with it. Uh, this may be one of the few years, Chris, where I'm 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 happy to say that the film I think is going to win Best Picture is one of my favorites of the year. We'll see if that happens or not. So okay. that is A Star is Born. I do think it's a great film. It's number two for me for the year. So since my drama of number one was already removed, that leaves <laughs> you with the number one pick. And Chris, because I'm using the tool that you just alluded to or at the beginning of the conversation, we use Letterboxd. Right. Uh, I have it down to two choices, which may be the film that you're going to pick as your number one. And I cannot wait to see which one it is. Okay. So what is your number one film for 2018? Okay. I wish we had video cameras because I'd like to see the expression on your face. Um, so uh, my number one film is Bad Times at the El Royale. Interesting. Um, this film was wow. directed by, yep. Yeah. I wish I could take a picture of Alan's expression. Huh. Um, it's directed by uh, Drew Goddard, who did Cabin in the Woods, which we did not review on the show. I don't think. Um, you and I have both seen it, though, I think. Um, but anyways, he did yes. Cabin in the Woods, mm -hmm. and uh, he did Bad Times at the El Royale. It's circa 1969, several strangers, most with a secret to bury, meet by chance at a hotel, the El Royale, and um, interesting things happen. Hmm. Uh, the cast of this film, I've already told you who the director was, Jeff Bridges, Dakota Johnson, John Hamm, just good, great cast, interesting story. And I will say, without revealing any more, um, it's told non-linearly, okay. which makes it All interesting. Right. Um, this And there's also great soundtrack in the film as mm -hmm. well. Um, it used some period songs. It just had a lot of the cinematography was great. It just had a lot of elements that kind of all culminated and made me really appreciate it. And I can see it not being a lot of people's number one film of the year, mm -hmm. but this just kind of hit my sweet spot on a bunch of different, a bunch of different levels. Um, so for me, uh, it was close. Uh, American animals did actually honor the top spot for my personal favorite uh, top film of the year. But um, having just recently seen El Royale, it uh, knocked the American animals down the two. Wow. That is, um, I'm not going to say super surprising because I've actually heard a lot of good positive things about this film. And it's one that I kind of regret not having caught up with earlier. Um, for, for it to be your number one, that's you, you've surprised me, Mr. Fry. <laughs> and surprised me quite a bit. Yeah. Um, but that's great. So I, I love it. I, mean, I guess, that's, that's, you know, I could be swayed. It is the most recent film that I want. Like I just recently saw this a couple of days ago in preparation for this list. So does it have that advantage that it's the freshest, you know, biggest surprise kind of to me. I mean, maybe so. Um, I'm going to have another film when we get to that section of the podcast where we mm -hmm. talk about our biggest surprise, but maybe that helps sway it a little bit, but uh, yeah, it's my number one. Wow. Well, that is uh, surprising. <laughs> I mean, great, but surprising. Uh, sure. So that's look, can we just kind of recap our top five? Sure. So uh, number five, uh, Mary Poppins returns slash won't you be my neighbor for me and Isle of dogs for Chris. Number four was Sorry to Bother You and Black Klansman for me. Tully for Chris. Mm -hmm. Number three, Isle of Dogs for, for, for me. Uh, Sorry to Bother You for Chris. Number two, A Star is Born for me, American Animals, you. And then number one, American Animals for me, Bad Times at the El Royale for Chris. Yes. So three out of five. We matched. Not bad. Uh, granted, I did throw two more films in there, so it's really three out of seven. <laughs> Made but still, it a little easier. Um, sure. But we did match. I figured... Um, sorry to bother you. I knew you were a big fan of, I felt like it was going to be one of your top five. Right. Uh, I knew all of dogs was probably going to be a top five and American animals. I knew. Pretty so sure. those three, I was pretty confident in. And luckily we were on the same page with those three. Uh, I know I've got a much higher estimation of stars born than you did. Um, and I think I've got a slightly higher, uh, estimation of Mary Poppins returns. Uh, but I also know we both like want to be my neighbor and black Klansmen. We both like Tully so I think for the most part, our films, everything's in sync. The only film we've mentioned that I have not seen was your number one. Right. And I think you've seen all the ones I mentioned. So that is our top five. Not bad. No. Threw a couple of surprises in there. So I think that <laughs> yeah. was, that would made it fun and interesting. 
We'll get back to your show in a moment. Just a reminder, you're listening to The Mesh, an online media network of shows and programs ranging from business to arts, sports to entertainment, music to community. All programs are available on the website as well as through iTunes and YouTube. Find out more at themesh.tv and give us feedback on what you like. And now, as promised, back to your show. So, Chris, with the top five out of the way, let's move on to a category that, you know, is a little painful to talk about. But, I mean, we do have to at least allude to something that maybe didn't work as well for us this past year. Um, The most frustrating film experience. Now, I'm kind of keeping it broad as saying film experience. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it doesn't even have to be specifically just a film. It could just be something with a film going experience this year that left us frustrated or, I guess, that's the best word, angst about it, whatever it may be. Okay. Um, if it's okay, how about I'll hop in there and do mine? Sure. I'll do mine first. Okay. Um, you know, I really wrestled with this for a while because there was a film experience I had watching a film, and it was it was frustrating because the film just did not live up to any expectations I had. But it was also a very small film and not one I really want to dwell on during this show. It's not worth for, for the filmmaker to me to dwell on it. And small film, I want people to go see it. So, you know, and support independent film. Okay. So let me go on the complete opposite end of the scale. Okay. Um, I looked at the top five highest grossing films of worldwide for 2018. And let me rattle them off to you. Let me mention the top four specifically. This is where, what the audiences have said. We're going to put the most money of, out of our pockets they into at the movie theaters. Sure. We had Avengers Infinity Wars, number one, like over $2 billion. We had um, Black Panther with about $1.3, $1.5, somewhere in there. We're right? pretty high, over a billion dollars. We had The Incredibles 2 also in that mix up there over a billion dollars. Okay. All three of those I'm fine with because – you know, I may have some misgivings here or there with some of the films, uh, but overall, they were enjoyable pieces of pop culture entertainment. They fed some of my you know, desire for ongoing storytelling on like the Avengers film. Black Panther was enough uniqueness to it and kind of a different type of hero. The Incredibles 2 proved that you can revisit a property so many years later and still make a very entertaining, fun version of it. But the number, the fourth film that crossed a billion dollars was Jurassic World Falling Kingdom. Hmm. That probably is my most frustrating film experience this year because not because I, I disliked the film so strongly. I, I did. It's more the fact that this film is sucking in a billion dollars <laughs> and it's the fifth film in a dinosaur Jurassic Park franchise. And I just don't feel like they figured out what to do with this franchise to make it really worthwhile anymore. Okay. Honestly, since the very first film, they haven't had it figured out. It's been kind of a mess. Every film has been just really kind of a miss. Uh, creatively, it's been a miss. Uh, directorially, it's been a miss. Definitely on the writing standpoint, none of them have been really good written films. It's almost like they just don't know what to do with dinosaurs anymore. And they're throwing everything they can out there, and it just doesn't work. Um, to take the film Fallen Kingdom, which I thought had interesting cinematography at times. I thought some interesting choices for shots just was kind of boring Threw in a lot of little subplots that didn't mean anything. The only promise I got out of that film experience is that maybe they've got an interesting idea for the next one. The whole idea of I'm not going to, I can go ahead and spoil it. Now the film's been out for a long time. (laughs) Sure. Leaving with the idea that now dinosaurs are roaming free in our society. Maybe they do something interesting with that. I don't know. I guess it's just more frustrating to me that you've got so many talented people working on a project, working on a franchise that is still bringing in over a billion dollars because there's not a lot of incentive for them to get better with it. It's more just keep churning out what they're doing. But I want something to work with this franchise, and it just hasn't for so long. So that is my frustrating film experience. I, I I would feel better about it if the movie had not made as much money. I think, well, maybe audiences are starting to catch on that it's just not all there right now. But it's not happening. It's making probably more money than than ever, these last two films. So that is my frustrating experience. I wish Jurassic Park or Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom was not as uh, popular as it had been. (laughs) So with that, what was your most frustrating film experience, Chris? 
My most frustrating film experience of 2018 was the film Vice. <laughs> uh, it has been nominated for six Golden Globes at the time of this recording, or by the time you hear this recording, you will know whether it won any of those six Golden Globes. True. It is from the Academy Award winning director um, and co-writer of The Big Short. So that is Adam McKay. It stars Christian Bale, Amy Adams, Steve Carell, Sam Rockwell, and Tyler Perry. Um, I don't think he won a. I don't think he won a um, an Academy Award for directing. I think he won it for writing because he co-wrote The Big Short. So I think that's what he actually won the Academy Award for. Anywho, Vice tells the story of Dick Cheney. Um, if you don't know who this person is, he was a, a Washington insider who quietly wielded immense power as vice president to George W. Bush. This film is just really difficult for me to f- figure out how I feel about it, which in some instances could mean it was, I'm glad I had the film going experience. I'm glad I saw this film, but it really frustrated me because, um, and you and I have, you've seen this film as well. And we've talked mm-hmm. about, you and I have not talked about the discuss the film on air, but I said, don't worry, it'll come in on this year end wrap up podcast we're doing. For me, I found it frustrating because it, it's trying to do too much. It's not just a straight biography, but it's trying to be a comedy. And mm-hmm. I think that's where the problem comes in because Dick Cheney, obviously he's a real person. Um, if you want to make a comedy, which is, you know, he has background with Will Ferrell and doing things like, um, I don't know if he directed Anchorman, but Talladega Nights, that, that type stuff. So mm-hmm. I just making a comedy out of somebody who was a vice president over serious times like nine 11 and things like mm-hmm. that. I, I just struggled with it tonally. Mm-hmm. Um, and there, I, I just felt like if you want to make a, if you want to make a film, that's a biography, do that. And if, but it's so politically driven. I think Mr. McKay obviously has some political leanings. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I just really struggled with sometimes I felt like it was nothing but a hatchet job. Mm-hmm. And, I, I there's a sequence that comes kind of halfway through the credits that even derailed, like I was having struggling with <laughs> things during the film. And then the little thing that happens halfway through the credits made me so angry. <laughs> and I actually walked out of the movie like angry, angry. Now then I don't know what Mr. McKay's goal was in making this. Maybe he is trying to do nothing more than get people to feel strongly about what's going on with politics yeah. and stuff. And if that's his goal, well, then he succeeded. I just, I don't know. I feel like the time to rise people's ire and get people angry is, is not now. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we have not talked about this film. Um, but that's definitely my biggest. It wasn't, it wasn't my biggest frustration of the year, obviously, but it, it, it was not a film I liked very much. Um, for a lot of the same reasons you described. And I do think tonally it's really all over the place. Yeah, it was hard for me to go from a scene that was kind of funny, tongue in cheek, to all of a sudden a scene where we're dealing with people's lives and we're dealing with you know war and casualties yes. and all this stuff. Um, I also came away not knowing what the film was intending to do. Agreed. For the most part, I think it's just let, let me show you how bad a person Dick Cheney is. But then there were moments where that didn't seem to be the intent at all. It actually seemed to be quite the opposite. Right. And it actually kind of left me a little confused at the end, kind of where or where. I mean, if you're going to be a director that's going to make a very uh, opinionated, uh, self-referential piece, I need to know at the end of the film kind of where you stand on it. And there's some moments late in the film, especially in the kind of closing moments of the film, where I'm just like, okay, well, I don't really know where you are right now. Right. And then, like you said, the mid credit sequence, which was kind of insulting to audience. It's basically saying, Very insulting it's like, hey, you know, you guys are just a bunch of idiots that don't know what you're watching right now. And uh, you should be paying more attention to this stuff. It was very condescending. And I didn't very like insulting. it. So um, I gave it a, a couple marks for still being creative. I, I think what, what he was trying to do is I think he saw that people really responded pretty well to the big short, mm-hmm. which was told in this, let's tell a real life situation but let's tell it in a very creative way and let's break the fourth wall and kind of have some fun with it. But I think you could do that when you're talking about wall street a little easier than you could politics and war and, you know, people's Basically livelihoods. Blaming so much stuff on one individual, making yeah. him out to be the antichrist. Right. I feel like is a little unfair. I, I agree. And I just don't think that that style worked for this subject matter. Right. I will say, I thought Christian Bell's performance was really solid. 
but um, Agreed. even and I think performance. You know, if you've seen the trailer, you may not say, "Hey, I didn't even recognize it was Christian Bale." Yeah, there's a lot of makeup and stuff going on, but I feel like there's also a lot of just the way he's delivering lines, oh, yeah. and there's a there's a lot more to it than just putting on a lot of weight and Absolutely. wearing a lot of makeup. Absolutely, he. I mean, I really could. I there were some moments where they're showing some what's meant to be news footage in the movie of Dick Cheney and. I couldn't tell if it was real or if it was Christian Bale, mm-hmm. but yeah, the film, I, I, the film was just kind of a mess. It was throwing a lot of things up on the screen to see what kind of reactions it got. And then by the end, it's basically selling saying audience, you're kind of stupid for not being more invested in this. That's kind of the, the takeaway I got from it. So mm-hmm. I'm with you on that. It was probably one of our more interesting screening experiences based on some of the reactions in the crowd and yeah, people re- responding to certain parts of the film. Definitely crowd so, interactions yeah. or crowd reactions and stuff. Yeah, that's why I can't say it was a terrible film. It just was very challenging. It wasn't – I don't know what I expected, but I didn't expect to be challenged with how I felt about a film. Um, and this just really – yeah, because the tonal stuff, it was, yeah. it was definitely a frustration. Okay. Fair enough. All right. So that was our most frustrating film experience. Yes. But let's go ahead and turn back to the positives if we can. So along with those frustrating experiences, we also had a couple surprising film experiences for the year. And uh, I'll go ahead and kind of hit mine first if you want. So even though this is a film I did not love, um, you and I talked offline about this film recently. Okay. And even though people are going to think I should have loved this film, given my preference for this character and all, um, I didn't love it, but I will say it was my biggest surprise with how successful and po- and good the film did turn out to be. And that is Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse mainly because I'm a huge Spider-Man fan, but when I saw the initial trailer or teaser or description of this film and it being this cross dimensional kind of science fictiony big concept film of a Spider-Man from all these different dimensions coming together and all being self-referential and being breaking the fourth wall and all this meta stuff. That's not my bag. <laughs> it is not what I was interested in at all. Sure. I really thought, why is this film not going straight to video? Why is it not just something being playing, you know, on iTunes? What I can't believe this film is getting a theatrical release. And I can't believe that the film, they actually made a film off of this concept. Um, in the Spider-Man comics in several last five or six years, there's been a storyline of this whole spider verse and I've not been interested one bit. It's like, I, it gets so far away from this idea of the reason I like the character is that he is more of a local friendly neighborhood, you know, helping the old lady, uh, up the, uh, up the street while rescuing the cat, while also fighting off uh, the green goblin, some ridiculous kind of costume okay. villain. So the idea of jumping into different dimensions and science fiction and all that stuff just never worked for me with the character. So those are the reasons why I don't love the film because I'm not a huge fan of that concept for the character, but I will say going into the film, I'm surprised, happily surprised a, how positive this film has been reviewed by basically everybody else in the world how successful it's been for an animated film that really had not much on the radar going into it. Uh, A lot of hype wise, I don't feel like. Sure. And I did find it to be very enjoyable, even though it just fell short of me saying, I love this film. So I will say it was my biggest surprise that this was even a film to begin with and that it has caught the critical reviews that it has so far this year on letterbox i think it's the highest rated reviewed average film right now in 2018 i um i'll echo uh, i have a joint biggest surprise okay. of the year that's good so and one of the films is spider-man and the spider-verse for all the reasons you said i was not familiar with the concept of the multiverse the spider-verse mm-hmm. so didn't really know that much but I, like you, saw the trailer for this film a couple of months ago. I'm like, uh, that looks like a direct-to-DVD release. Why are they putting it in theaters? And why at Chris- or around Christmas yeah. time? Like, aren't you wasting a spot you could be using for something else? Was not interested in seeing this film at all. Yeah. However, mm-hmm. um, it did come out. And then I started to hear a lot of positive buzz. And I was like, well, okay, I'll check this thing out. And I really, really, really liked it. You liked it it actually better than I did. I I absolutely did. Crazy. Maybe it's because I'm not as 
endeared of the subject material. So yeah, because I'm be. not, you know, I don't adore it as much or don't, I'm not as familiar with it. Maybe that helped me kind of enjoy the ride because I wasn't aware of what ride I was going to be on. Sure. Um, there Good are point. some surprises, some reveals of who some characters are. And I had no idea that was coming. Mm-hmm. So that, that was a really pleasant surprise. Um, I really hope um, although, you know, I, I really hope this, I wouldn't mind if I love dogs won for best. You know, I hope that a, I can't imagine this won't be nominated for best Oscar for animated feature. You would think so. I really hope it wins. Um, it would be pretty wild to see this one win. Uh, yeah. Cause I just, I loved, I love a lot of Disney work. Um, and I love dogs is not Disney, but, um, you know, it's normally it's like, okay, what's the Disney film? And that's the one that's going to win the well, best. Well, Disney film. slash Pixar, you know, yeah, that's kind of been, Pixar. that's kind of exactly. been the deal right. for so many years. Sure. Or maybe you get into DreamWorks, getting some big Shrek. One I time, guess yeah. it's all the CGI right. animated stuff. Right. I'm kind of getting tired of, and I, I think the fact that Spider-Verse came out and it was, not that same 3D type animation. It was a lot more 2D. It has some 3D elements to it, but stylistically, it's so different right. than what we've seen. Just like to me, Isle of Dogs is so different from an anime standpoint. Right. And Incredibles, uh-huh. too. A lot of people liked. I was kind of lukewarm on it. You know that's going to get nominated because it yeah. is Disney Pixar. This to come out, you know, not only did it awaken my interest again in animation, which mm-hmm. it did, because like you say, I'm kind of burned out on some of the other stuff, but it managed to kind of make me happy about superhero movies again, that's, which well, that's, I'm kind that's of burned cool. out on that. Yeah. So, you know, it's that now all that being said with all the money it's made, am I leery that they're going to make a sequel? Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> I think they've already yeah. even announced plans to start working on a sequel, but I think they're going to be focusing on the uh, female, the spider Gwen, the okay. uh, character, which you know, it's fine. Yeah. No, I'm, I, I will say it's my biggest surprise just because I, I was pleasantly surprised to see it do so well. And I do think if it helps break the mold of what we expect to see in animated films and in superhero films going forward, then I'm all for it. Um, so that's, that's great. So I, you know, it wasn't anywhere near my top five this year, but I still had a really good time with it and enjoyed it for what it was, but more appreciate it for what it's able to do hopefully to the industry going forward you said you had a joint one so what's your other surprise So my other um, biggest surprise was um this was actually a film that um we reviewed for the film festival and it didn't actually make it into our film festival because we had so many films and the screening committee kind of ranked them and this one just fell out yeah. of the ones we were able to bring but it's mining the gap the documentary yeah, the one um, i missed Alan, you mentioned is one yes. that you didn't catch up with but um i think on the surface this film it's about three friends Um, childhood friends about their growing up and this guy's documented over a couple of years and they all like to skateboard and it has some really awesome skateboarding cinematography, some really cool shots of skateboarding and you know, down these big city streets. And it's just, it's really beautiful to look at. It's edited really well. The music's really nice, but you'd think like, okay, you know, so what? I don't really care about skateboarding. I've seen a million movies about, you know, people coming of age. This is a documentary, but still I've seen coming of age documentaries again. So what? There is a lot more to it. And, um, there's some emotional ties that the boys don't realize they have in common that kind of come to light about halfway through the film. And I'm not going to spoil anything. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's just some revelations that come about, that are really interesting that I wasn't expecting. And at the end kind of gut punch you. And so I wow. wasn't expecting that. And it was, it was really good. So without giving away <laughs> what the biggest surprise is um, in mining the gap, that was the biggest surprise for me this year hmm. going into it. So, okay. Well, that is even more reason for me to make sure I go and check it out now. So, cause I have not had a chance to do that yet. So um, like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, one of my overlooked films for the year. So we got some nice surprises for us here. So Chris, that's technically the end of our kind of recap categories, but I think there's a few films that we haven't touched on that we still want to kind of call some attention to ones that didn't make our top five or our best surprises, but are still ones we think kind of looking back at the year might be some honorable mentions. If you want to use that phrasing for it, Absolutely. Um, I'll mention a few okay. uh, if it's okay with you here first. Sure. Um, a Tully was on my honorable mention. I mentioned that one as well already. Uh, it was one where we didn't have it on the same type top five list. I will say Roma was one I did have as an honorable mention. I did like Roma. I, it's on my list as Is well. Is it okay? I like it quite a bit. We reviewed um, it on the show. It was a top 10 film for me, you know, but I want to call attention to it because, again, we're doing something a little different where it's a Netflix delivered film, uh, black and white, foreign language. 
uh, very kind of a more uh, fly on the wall filmmaking style, but still very effective. And mainly because of three or four sequences in the film that I can still picture in my head and I think are very impactful. Um, the film really worked for me. So I'm going to say Roma was one of my honorable mentions. Okay. I, a documentary that I know you have still not had a chance to see yet because I don't even know how you would see it yet okay. is uh, Bisbee 17. Oh, whenever that does come out. That is a regret. That one is a top 10 film for me as well for the year. Very, a very memorable experience of a, of a uh, documentary. Uh, again, it was a, I know I discussed it as a recommendation in a previous episode, sure. so I won't spend a whole lot of time on to it, but just a really fascinating uh, film uh, to, to bring up and, and hold on. I was going to bring up a really quick uh, synopsis of it um, while we're talking here. I forgot to do that, but I did want to mention at least kind of what the film is about. Sure. You know, it's directed by uh, Robert Green, who did the film Click Kate Plays Christine. Which I have seen that. You one. have seen that. And the film is basically uh, explores an old mining town on the Arizona-Mexico border that is kind of having to reckon with something from its own past. A hundred years earlier, it had done a mass deportation of 1,200 immigrant miners from the town. And so this is now the town kind of recreating that, that mass uh, deportation uh, as kind of a way to symbolize it and memorialize it. And uh, the way the director got involved with that process and kind of encouraged them to restage this and then the way he filmed it was really, really impressive and very emotional. So hmm. Bisbee 17 is one of my uh, honorable mentions. Okay. And uh, the last one I'll mention on my uh, honorable mentions, a film I just caught up with recently, and I know you have mentioned on your uh, on a recommendation or possibly a re- – I think yours is a review you did for the film Hereditary. I took a really long time to get around to seeing you liked this. liked it more than I did. I did like it more than you did. Um, you, you watched it at the peak of buzz about the film. I watched it now that all the buzz has been let out of the balloon. <laughs> and uh, I watched it at home on a early morning with sunlight shining through yeah, the windows. You didn't and, have to be scared of it. And I got you. Okay. And it was still a very uh, creepy experience. I liked the film because um, I didn't know where it was going. And it did kind of curve a little bit for me. And I liked it. I followed it along for the curve. Uh, I was willing to go with it. I thought cinematography was beautiful, I thought it was a well shot film. The acting by uh, Tony Collette Tony was Collette, pretty sure. amazing. Um, it it didn't rely on jump scares, which is a, a plus for me. True, it's more music and environment. It's more environment, and, and even the fact that things you see in a frame uh, that you're not even sure are there all the time. That's that's the stuff that works for me. So, uh, really, really liked it more than I thought I would. I'm not a big horror movie fan, and this one still has scarred me a little bit. Um, <laughs> But I can don't definitely like when ad- people walk up behind you and chomp their teeth or their no, jaw no, together. No. Really quick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the little clicking sound. Now, yeah. I don't like that, but uh, I will say I admire the film that it is, and I'm kind of excited to see what this guy does next. So, that's my honorable mentions. Do you have some other and ones? The to director's add? Ari Aster. That's correct. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, so my for my honorable mentions, two that are you mentioned Roma. You've also talked about Black Klansman and Won't yes. You Be My Neighbor, both of which we reviewed on the show. Those were, you know, probably top 10 for me. Mm-hmm. Um, two that you did not mention and were just recently bumped off because of Mr. Bad Times at the El Royale were uh, First Reformed and Annihilation. Okay. Uh, we did, I think, review, we reviewed both of those. No, Annihilation we did not review on the show because you just recently caught up with it. I did. Um, First Reformed we did review on the show. We both reviewed. We both admired. Right. Um, challenging film that I think we both respected right. uh, from Paul Schrader. And uh, man, I think we both were pretty impressed with Ethan Hawke's performance. Sure. Um, the ending we thought was effective the way it was really handled. So, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, th- those are my honorable mentions. So, so annihilation. Um, yeah, I did watch. Okay. And, and I, I can already tell I liked it more than you. You did. <laughs> I'm gonna uh, be, I, I respect it. Okay. Uh, it did not work for me as I, I think it's the same, the same way with ex, ex machina. I liked it and I respected it and I see the craft in it. I'm glad I saw it, but I didn't have that same admiration for it Mm. that you did. So it was the same way with uh, Ex Machina and now it's uh, Annihilation. Now it's Annihilation. So interestingly, mm. a film that I would lump in that category, even though it's by a totally different director, whereas Annihilation and Ex Machina, both by Alex Garland, um, Mm. is Under the Skin. And you did really like Under the Skin. For some reason, I kind of lumped it because it's kind of like subtle sci-fi genre. Oh, yeah. I loved Under the Skin. Right. So it's kind of interesting with, uh, I don't know. 
Because I think if you're on board for one, you're all three. But um, sort of yeah, case. something about it. maybe it was. It felt like there were some really distinct similarities between the two films, and I felt like maybe it was being a little repetitive in some okay. parts. Um, I did like the mixture of the first half of the film being kind of a more traditional horror film or of a party going into a woods type of thing mm-hmm. and things happening to, to different members along the way. And then it definitely goes into definitely more of the sci-fi element in the latter half of the film. And I like that just just position. I like the ending. I love the end shot. I think the end shot is, it's a great ending oh, to a sci-fi film. Sure. You know, um, but it just as a whole, the film was fine. It was fine. It was oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, I liked it, but I, I just didn't have it. It didn't show up anywhere near my top 10. Death. Yeah, I know. Fine. yeah. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. But I'm with you. And none of the films you have brought up or I don't think vice versa. We dislike of each other's probably the one with the biggest discrepancy is a stars born for me in my top five. Yeah, you I probably have the like lower, it. a much lower view of it sure. than I did, but Sure. Uh, we we generally are have compatible films throughout our list here, so that's that's pretty good. I'll take that. Can I mention one more little quick point about 2018 before we mention the anticipated for 2019? Sure. Go for it. These aren't really honorable mentions because I mean I don't think we need to give these films any more attention than they've gotten this year. But I do want to make a point of saying, you know, we I, I keep reading so many times about people getting burnt out by superhero films where they feel like maybe we've crest on those or blockbuster franchises and how ideas have kind of ran out and you know how it's weakening Hollywood by having these films be so big and consuming so many screens in the multiplex. Let me just say, I think 2018 kind of for me showed that blockbusters still work. They can. I thought Avengers infinity war. I know I liked a lot better than you did, but I really had a good time with it. And the entire audience I was with Hmm. had a good theater going experience watching a film like that where we've been kind of building up with these characters for years. And then you have this big culmination remember with Avengers infinity war, that was the one that I was really leery about. Cause it's like, how are you going to fit all these characters into this one big film? And it worked. And I didn't feel like it was too over bloated. I thought it did justice to everybody and it was great. So that still works. There's still an audience there. There's still excitement around that film. Some reviewers have that as one of their favorites of the year. I mean, it still got a lot of good attention. Sure. I already mentioned Incredibles 2. To come back on a film, what, 12, 15 years later? Something like that. And still knock out a pretty entertaining film. I mean, it wasn't as good as the original, but it was a fun film to still to have this year. And then I'll say Mission Impossible Fallout. Who would have thought this? How does that not make your top five? No, it's, it, it's maybe top ten. Okay. Uh, it was good, and I had a great time with it, but the sixth film of this franchise if you had told me back after the john woo one and number two that this <laughs> film this franchise was actually going to get better over time right and to make a sixth one that is actually not only very financially successful but one of the better action pure action movies i've seen in quite a while i'm like that's pretty cool so i say blockbusters still work and you know any naysayers that say that they're hurting cinema or they're diluting. I mean, I think we saw just as many really interesting, smaller independent films as there were available big blockbuster films. And with things like Netflix and other places, we have room for all of them. I can go to the multiplex and pay $12 and go see Avengers with a huge crowd of people ready to cheer it on. Or I can go home and watch Roma on my big screen TV in a more intimate experience and have just as thrilling a time in both. And that's sure. cool. So uh, I'm okay with that. So, my message about 2018, I did. I do think it proves that blockbusters kind of still work. So, sure. uh, yeah. I will say kind of tail ending on that. Um, I, like you, watched Roma on my laptop because it's on Netflix. Actually, no, I did watch it on my TV. But still, I would have appreciated being able to watch it in a theater. And I wonder if my estimation of it would have gone up a little bit. And maybe it would have crept into my top five had I watched it in a theater. Because something about the theater going experience... I feel like would have added to Rome just because of the nice long takes and kind of the pain yeah. as they do. Like I think it might have meant more because it would have seemed more majestic on the big screen as opposed to just the pan. Possibly so. But yeah, I, I could have seen that. I could see that. I mean, no, I, I, I believe me. I would much rather always watch a film in a movie theater if I have a chance. Sure. But Roma would not have shown in a movie theater here in our town. Correct. Our, <laughs> so, our way to see you it. Know, so our sure. chance to see it and actually get the same level of attention that a big blockbuster would, would be to put it on the big splash screen on Netflix when you boot it up and you get to watch it. So, sure. um, All right. 
So do we want to talk about our most anticipated film of 2019? So 2018, night, night, we read you your story, <laughs> time to go to bed, close the door, turn off the light. Now let's move on to 2019. There's a lot of films coming out in 2019, of course. A lot of franchise films and sequels. So let's just go ahead and assume we're going to wipe those off the list. Okay. They're not eligible for us to choose as our most anticipated film. And I'll go ahead and, you know, just so we we're not all down on sequels. You know, you've talked about how. Let's just go ahead and mention some of the ones. You know, well, Star I've got Wars episode seven. Star I'm, Wars episode nine. Absolutely, that's one that's not eligible. I am very much looking forward to that. I I, I wish it wasn't J J Abrams directing it again. Because I love what Ryan Johnson did so much, and I love the fresh perspective a new director takes each time. Right. I was hoping that was the direction they were going to go, but when the whole Trevor uh, uh, Trevor O Colin situation Trevor. Uh, fell apart, and they had to bring J.J. Abrams in to save it, um, all right, that's fine. I like the Force Awakens. We'll see what he does with Episode Nine, but I'm with you on that. So that's that's one you know sequel franchise that we won't mention. Another one which I don't know if it's on a list of things you're excited about, but but I am. Um, and it's actually coming out semi soon, I think is glass. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, just because I want to see how Shyamalan closes out. Am I a little worried because Shyamalan has kind well, of I'm had very worried. a rocky track record, Yeah, but I believe I liked split better than you. I you think you did. Yep. You um, did. We both like unbreakable a lot. Absolutely. So I'm just, I'm hoping that he can still ride the momentum that he kind of built up with split, which was very successful. I'm hoping that pays off, but I will say after the amount of previews I've seen, I think I've seen an extended one now. <sighs> I'm getting a little worried that basically I've seen the absolute entire movie in the trailer. That's where it worries me. And I, I, I'm a little concerned, but I'm, I'm actually mad at myself for watching the trailers. Cause I do feel like I've got a basic sense of what the movie's going to be. And if that's all it is, yeah, it's going to be kind of a disappointment. Yeah. So I'm with you. Uh, I had glass on my list of ones. I wanted to kind of go ahead and just table off to the side and say, yes, I know we're excited about these, but we're not going to like make them our most anticipated one. And I'll mention one last one, even though it's, I don't think you could consider it a sequel, but it's just kind of in the universe of DC comics. It's the Joker movie oh, directed yeah. by Todd Phillips that's starring Joaquin Phoenix as the Joker. I would more refer to that one as my most curious film of 2019, because I honestly am very curious what they're going to do with that. So that, um, but I'm putting that aside just sure. because, you know, it's kind of, Oh, I got quantity. several more. Sorry. I'm going to go ahead and say <laughs> okay. it, it chapter two. I'm interested in yeah. because I think the first chapter was pretty good. Um, I like the fact that there's some really good actors and uh, attached to play the adult versions of the kids. So okay. I'm kind of excited to see what they're going to do. Okay. I had glass on there. Godzilla King of Monsters. Cue the Chris uh, Fry eye rolls. But shrug. that's, uh, <laughs> I'm still excited about that. Fair enough. Yes, my Marvel movies, Captain Marvel, Avengers Endgame, Spider-Man Far From Home. Yes, yes, yes. I'll, I'm looking forward to all those. <laughs> but let's just push all those aside. Okay. Let's focus on films that are going to be really more original films that were the ones we're excited about this year. So, Chris, what do you have as your most anticipated film of 2019? So, Interestingly enough, mm-hmm. you mentioned how Mr. Tavaro was not going to get to do episode nine. Neither is the guy who directed episode eight, which was yeah. Ryan Johnson, mm-hmm. which I really loved. Um, some people that Alan and I work with did not really love that. Uh, we're t- thinking about you, Brad. I'll go ahead and t- <laughs> call you out. Brad gets um, a call out in the show right. for not um, liking The Last Jedi. That's right. Um, I did like The Last Jedi. But um, I'm happy that he made a really big budget movie. He's made other things like Brick. He made Looper. And then he returns to this idea that he's doing for his film that's supposedly coming out uh, November 27th in 2019. It's called Knives Out. Mm -hmm. And the only description you can really find about it is that it's a modern murder mystery in a classic whodunit Agatha Christie type style. Let me tell you the cast. We have Daniel Craig, Chris Evans, Jamie Lee Curtis, Michael Shannon, Christopher Plummer, Tony Collette, Don Johnson, which I don't know what that would mean, but <laughs> he's done some good things, and the Keith Stanfield. I mean, a really awesome cast. He is directing it. He also wrote it. That is my most anticipated movie because – Actually, when I went to go see Murder on the Orient Express that Kenneth Branagh did, I think just last year, um, which was an adaptation of an Agatha Christie, I was really looking forward to like a mystery on the big screen that was going to be well shot, had a huge cast of people. I could not have been more disappointed. Yeah, it's um, pretty bad. I just felt it was really – granted, I mean, it's 
you know, honoring the subject material, but I just thought it was kind of silly and just, I don't know. I, I could, I was really disappointed or yes. frustrated. That might've been my biggest frustration maybe from 2017 if it was 2017, but my biggest anticipated for all those reasons is this sounds like it could be what I wanted that movie to be. Um, so knives out Ryan Johnson. I got to wait till November 27th to find out, but that's my most anticipated movie. For okay. 2019. I, uh, I had a couple in rotation. I was going to wait and see which one you mentioned and knives out was one I had listed. So okay. I can move that off my list. Fair enough. But I will say that, um, all the great actors you listed in knives out. Did you even mention Christopher Plummer? Yeah. Tony quickly. Collette. Did you? All that. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. basically that's got a great section of Hollywood, which on that a lot film. of times I will say just, you know, when you look at something like that, that can kind of scare you. Cause you're like, Oh, a bunch of great names. That may mean, you know, it could be kind of a warning sign, but I don't care. I'm still excited. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. So the entire rest of Hollywood ah. is signed on for the film. I'm going to say is my most anticipated for 2019. Okay. Um, all right. I will say that this, this director, writer, director's last film wasn't kindly reviewed by you and I. However, everybody makes has their missteps, <laughs> and I'm willing to excuse it because of the whole body of work preceding the last film, and Think that is I know where you're going. Quentin Tarantino. Yeah. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood comes out August 9th. And like I said, it's got the entire rest of Hollywood <laughs> performing in this sure. because we have Margot Robbie, Leonardo DiCaprio, Brad Pitt, Al Pacino, Kurt Russell, Dakota Fanning, Tim Roth, Bruce Dern, Zoe Bell, Lena Dunham, and several others. Sure. It's a story about a faded TV actor and his stunt double embarking on an odyssey to make a name for themselves in the film industry during the helter-skelter reign of terror in 1969 Los Angeles. So I, you know, Inglorious Bastards... One of my absolute favorite films oh, yeah. of all time. Agreed. Um, I think the films that were around that, Kill Bill, uh, Django Unchained, in that period of time are classics for me. Great films all the way around. Yes, The Hateful Eight did not work. Um, I thought it was just, it was very minor Tarantino. And I think probably by a big gap, it was the one film I can look at and say, yeah, yeah, that one just didn't work. And I revisited that this year because yeah. I was curious about something. There are scenes that absolutely are awesome, sure. but yeah. as a whole, as a whole, yeah, the film doesn't, doesn't work. Yeah, but you know, everybody can have their their slip up. I'm I'm excited about this. I think also he's taking a little more time with this one, you know, and uh, he's got a great cast, which mm-hmm. will be granted. He always has a good cast, but True. this one's a really good cast. And uh, I love films about filmmaking and movie making and behind the scenes of Hollywood. The fact that when this film was announced, it was going to be a Charles Manson film. Which I think we use that as a news item, and you and I are both like, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But now that they've kind of fleshed it out a little bit more, we see, no, it just happens to be taking place during, during this. Era. And he will probably, you know, it'll be mentioned, obviously, because they talk about the helter skelter type well, stuff. Well, and because uh, Margot Robbie is playing Sharon Tate. Okay. So obviously, there is a very direct connection to Got it. You. My question is, I don't know, is this going to be comedic? Is this going to be scary? Is this going to be mm. intense? Is this going to be, what is it? I don't know. Who knows? And I'm kind of excited the fact that I don't know. When The Hateful Eight was described and sold, we kind of knew what film we were going to be getting into. Sure. This one, I don't know. Is it biographic? I mean, is it truly biographical about some actors? Is it all completely fanciful? I, we have no idea. So I'm excited to see with this. Um, we only give Mr. Tarantino a chance to, to get back on track and uh, <laughs> see what we can turn out with this one. Yeah. So that's our two. Both films with a huge cast on both yeah. sides. Now... Can I mention just two more films really quick? Sure. Only because I had a hard time deciding which one I wanted to say is my most anticipated. Okay. Um, Only because I just saw the trailer for this film just a couple of days ago, and it wasn't even really on my radar before that. Hmm. But the newest one from Jordan Peele. Oh, Us. Us. Have you seen the trailer for that? Yes. Okay. I think the trailer is pretty darn intense and frightening, and I'm excited to see what he does with this film. Uh, don't really have much of a description, but I do know it's Lupita Nyong'o, Winston Duke, Elizabeth Moss, and Tim Heidecker. It's kind of a, a great cast uh, looking at there as well. It looks like it's going to be a horror film, so I'm like with you a know, little bit of a social, maybe some sort of social issue to it. I don't I'm, know. What I'm curious is Get Out had quite a bit of com- comedy in it, but also obviously had the social commentary right. and the horror elements. From just what you see in the trailer, <laughs> it kind of looks like he – you know, accelerated on the horror aspects. Maybe. And I'm not sure if there's going to be any comedic stuff in there, which I will miss. 
Well, but, but keep does, in mind. It does still, you know? it looks good. I'm totally interested yeah. in it, but I'm curious if he's decided to kind of let some of the comedy elements drop away. Well, I remember the, the initial trailers for Get Out, I think really played up the horror side of it mm-hmm. too. Didn't really play up anything more lighter with it. So we'll see. Um, but one I'm probably the most curious about, I can't say it's my most anticipated, but one that. Because uh, that's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah, most anticipated yeah. is definitely Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Gotcha. This one I just wanted to bring up because we I mentioned about blockbusters and superhero movies, and you even said Spider-Verse kind of gave you a little more hope for maybe superhero right. movies going forward. Well, this one just came across my radar, like honestly, in the last week. Okay. And uh, it is produced by James Gunn, which if you remember, James Gunn was the director Guardians. of Guardians of the Galaxy. He was the one who was fired from the next version of that because of some uh, tweets he made on Twitter uh, years back that came back to in, into the, 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 the spotlight. But he is producing this film, and the film is written by, I assume, two brothers of his, Brian Gunn and Mark Gunn. Hmm. And if they're not brothers, I guess they're cousins or something. I'm not sure. It's a lot of guns out there. Yes. So There's also a Peter Gunn, who I know uh, also acted in Guardians of the Galaxy. His brother, One of his brothers did, too. Okay. Directed by David Yaravesky, and the film is called uh, Brightburn. Have you heard of this? I have not. Okay. So I want you to see the trailer for this film. Okay. Uh, I don't, this film could be horrible, but I love the premise. Okay. The premise is, what if a child from another world crash landed on Earth? Superman. Is raised by a couple. Superman. But instead of becoming a hero to mankind, hmm. he proved to be a far more sinister. The trailer basically starts out like the Superman story. Couple. There's a meteor crash, whatever, out in the woods. There are a couple that don't have kids. It's played by uh, Elizabeth Banks and David Denman. You remember David Denman was in... Uh, um, I know who Elizabeth Banks is. David Denman was in The Office, but he was in a film that we reviewed this year. Uh, he played the... Oh, he was in Puzzle. Remember, he was the husband in Puzzle. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was pretty good. Right. So... Um, huh. The trailer starts out, it's them as a couple, and they find this baby out in the, there, and the baby, you start to see him grow up as a kid, and you start to see he's got some powers, but then the kid turns kind of bad and realizes that with this power, I can actually do whatever Is I want to do. Is done as a drama or as a comedy? Oh, no, it's very much a horror. Oh, horror. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. Actually, the, when you see the trailer, it, the whole last half of the trailer is pretty scary. Who plays the... The kid? I don't know. Oh, okay. Never seen him before. Hmm. But looks like it could be really intense. I love the story idea behind it. Um, I love the kind of twisted view of the superhero stories. Yeah. But again, uh, the the uh, director has only done a lot of short films, and he did some supplemental stuff for Guardians of the Galaxy. So he's worked with the guns before. Uh, okay. But I think this may be his first big feature film. So hmm. curious. Yes. And it comes out May twenty fourth. Okay. Uh, Brightburn is the name of the film. <laughs> So, yeah, I had to at least mention those because those are just enough piquing my interest, but I just don't know enough about those. Still, the uh, Tarantino film is my most anticipated, though. Fair enough. Wow. Okay. Well, we had a good recap there. A lot going on. So we had our top five uh, that Chris and I both shared uh, with some overlaps between us. Our most frustrating film experiences of the year, our biggest surprises of the year uh, film-wise, some honorable mentions about films that we just uh, want to make sure got some recognition for the year. And then our most anticipated of 2019. So Chris, that is all we have for the show today. Yes. Uh, I'm sure people have opinions. They have <laughs> thoughts, you know, they're hearing it. Why did you leave off this film? How could you have put stars born as your number two, Alan? Uh, what were you thinking? Whatever the questions may be. If people do have those questions or thoughts or just any feedback at all, how, how can they reach out to us? You can send us an email at info at the mesh dot TV and put foot candle films in the subject line. And yeah, let us know what we got right, what we got wrong about our picks for 2018. Um, also, as I mentioned, Alan and I do have accounts on Letterbox, that website, which is without the E, so it's just B O X D, letter B O X D. We do have accounts on there where we try to give star ratings, list the films that we're watching every once in a while, maybe write a really quick review. But uh, that's another way you can kind of catch up with what we're thinking and i'm gonna throw a plug because we are now officially in 2019 which is the year of the fifth foot candle film festival which isn't until september 27th to the 29th but be here before we know it that's right but uh if you have a filmmaker and you would like to submit your film please go to uh foot candle film festival 
dot com and you'll find a link there to submit your film. Yeah, so we do encourage you to do that. If you know, if you are a filmmaker, if you have a film to share, if you know someone in the filmmaking world that has, has got a new film that they want to be getting at some festival, we'd love to run it by our screening committee and see if we can get it in the festival weekend. We normally show between 30, 35 films. And combination so, of short films and features. And uh, documentaries and narratives. Yep. So uh, anything goes in those areas, even animation, all's fine. And uh, we have a great audience of people that come and spend the weekend with us and enjoy the films. Last year, we had about 15, 18 filmmakers, I think, uh, total come and join us at some point during the festival weekend and talk about some of their films. So we uh, look forward to having some more people out this year and some great films to show. I'm going to brag on us just tagging on that just a little bit. Um, One of the filmmakers that came from Hungary to our film festival to show his uh, short film, Chuchutaj, uh, Barnabas Toth, his actually won Best Narrative Short at our film festival this year. And he is currently on the short list for the Academy Awards for live action short. He's on there with nine other films. They have a list of ten. And, of course, we're hoping that he gets to the final five. And, you know, we'd love it if he actually won the Academy Awards. Somebody else recognizing what a great film he made. So just throwing that out there, you know, who knows, maybe coming to our festival could lead to greater things for you. We at least hope it would. Yeah, no, I, and I'd like to think that, you know, we had something to do with it, um, you know, with them getting noticed for the Oscars, I'm sure. Well, yeah, right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm sure all the buzz coming from our, our festival said, you know what? That may be a, uh, a best short film candidate for the Oscars. So right. that's what we're going to be telling everything, everybody yeah. anyway. <laughs> yeah, best of luck to, uh, to Barnabas Toth on that, director, and um, uh, hope to be pulling for him on Oscar night as well. So, mm. All right, Chris. Well, we have been doing this show on TheMesh.tv, which you probably understand is a podcast that we do. And uh, this is a podcast episode that you download and play. But if you like what we're doing and you like listening to the show, and you want to make sure you always get new episodes that we put out, which is about every two weeks or so on average, uh, you can subscribe to the show. And that subscription you can do through Apple iTunes, Google Play Store. Um, I believe there's other applications. TuneIn, I believe you can subscribe through. Um, a lot of other ways, uh, Stitcher Radio. But you subscribe to the show, and that means that every time we put out a new episode, it gets delivered to you or whatever program or device you're using to listen to podcasts. It's kind of like subscribing or recording a TV show and making sure every new episode is available for you to watch on demand when you wish to. So we encourage you to do that. And you also visit the mesh.tv, the website where our show is hosted. And that way you can see other shows that are hosted by the mesh network and subscribe or listen to other episodes as well. We also encourage you to uh, keep in touch with us through the foot candle film society. That is at footcandle.org. Uh, and then of course the foot candle film festival that Chris already talked about, footcandlefilmfestival.com is the website going forward and there'll be as we get closer to the summertime a lot of information put up about the festival coming up the last weekend in September all right so for 2018 goodbye see ya what's the phrase we use bye Felicia is that the one that people use now (laughs) to 2018 onward with 2019 thanks for listening and uh, looking forward to a great new year see you in the ticket line Special thanks to Carpal Tuller for the show theme music. For more about Carpal Tuller, visit www.carpaltuller.com. You've been listening to The Mesh, an online media network of shows and programs ranging from business to arts, sports to entertainment, music to community. All programs are available on the website as well as through iTunes and YouTube. Check us out online at themesh.tv. Discover other network shows and give us feedback on what you just heard.